Welcome back to the Inside Java podcast, a podcast about everything Java brought to you from the folks at Oracle who make Java. My name is David Delabasse, and I'll be your host for this episode, episode 28. Today's episode is a conversation I had during Java 1 with Kevin Birman. Kevin works on the design of new Java language features. I sat down with him to discuss the evolution of the Java language, project timber, pattern matching, string template, and so on. But we also chatted a little bit about some of the challenges related to the design of features that millions of Java developers will end up using. So enjoy the show. So today I have with me uh, Gavin Bierman. It's not your first time on the show, Gavin, right? No, that's right. I've been here before. Great to meet in person. <laughs> yeah. Having said that, this is the first time we record together live. That's right. First, first time we've been face to face. It's also uh, my first job for one, my first time in Vegas. So everything's new. Okay, cool. So, uh, well, the reason we are uh, recording this is because uh, during Java 1, you are making multiple sessions related to Amber. So I thought it would be a good occasion to quickly discuss uh, that. The first topic that I'd like to discuss with you is pattern matching. Yeah. So um, pattern matching itself is not new. I mean, we have started a long time ago. Well, a few release, a feature release ago with pattern matching, for instance, off, and then we have kept improving uh, the, the pattern matching support into the platform. So maybe it's a good, it's a good idea to do a recap. So where we are with pattern matching, what have we done recently? I mean, in the latest uh, year, mm -hmm. and then we can discuss a little bit about maybe what's coming on. Yeah, great. So um, as you recall, when when we were last chatting, we were talking about pattern matching. Uh, we first re we're deliberately releasing this sort of bit, rather large feature in small increments, so uh, people can get used to how it works. Uh, the first uh, feature that we released was supporting type patterns in only an instance of expressions. So there, the idea the idea of a pattern is that it embodies a test. And pattern matching is the process of testing a value to see if it matches a pattern or not. Um, and we, the first pattern that we release a type pattern, so the test is just if you can be cast to the type. Um, this is very nice because using type patterns, you can remove a lot of casts from your program, your equality methods start looking better and so on. So this was a nice feature, but it's really only the first step in many steps that we plan to roll out pattern matching support in the language. So in Java 19, we are previewing uh, the next uh, class of pattern, which we call a record pattern. I remember when we spoke last time, we spoke a lot about record classes. So record classes are a special sort of class um, in that they're transparent. They uh, describe precisely their contents uh, and there's nothing else. Um, and also the values are immutable, so they can never change. Now, um, this is a good thing just programmatically, but uh, you can really build on this with patterns. So the idea of a record pattern is that it embodies two operations. One is, again, a test, whether you are of a, that particular record type. But then if you are, we can... Uh, have a description of what you would like to do with the contents of the record. And because record classes are very special, the compiler always knows exactly what the contents of the records are. There aren't any hidden uh, yeah. values or things missing. So um, you're able to write a, uh, a query almost, which is asking uh, or embodies a test about the shape of the data. So uh, th this really starts giving you a hint of the power that pattern matching can unlock. Uh, in particular, if you have, say, a record class where one of its components is also another record class, uh -huh. and maybe that's also got a record class in it and so on, you can actually nest the patterns in the same way that uh, that reflects the hierarchy that you have of your classes. And so you can write in one pattern really quite complicated navigation of your data, and you just write it as a pattern, and the compiler will unroll really quite 
complicated and sometimes quite tricky code and it just unrolls it for you you don't have to write anything so all issues to do with for example if something was a null or yep. or whatever it's it's all handled by the compiler if there is a null the pattern matching just says it doesn't match so there's no you you don't have the risk of null pointer exceptions so that's um something that we're we're shipping as a preview in 19 and also in 19 we're shipping as a preview the extension of switch, both switch expressions and switch statements, to support patterns in instead of the labels. So in a switch block, uh, currently in Java, um, the case labels are constants. Yep. Um, and that's a very nice feature. But what we'd like to do is build on that and allow you to write patterns as the labels. So now the semantics of switch is fairly intuitive. Instead of testing whether your value is equal to one of those constant labels, uh, the semantics now changes to being, do you pattern match against the patterns? And we, we test the various patterns to, to see which uh, case you, you match. Um, so we've, we've had several releases of that, but um, and, and so in 19, it's the third release of pattern matching for Switch. In of itself, it's uh, not too complicated a feature, but there's a very uh, interesting, uh, since I'm sort of scientifically minded, interesting but complicated interaction between record patterns and switching with pattern labels. And this is to do with a property that we would like to enforce on switches that use patterns, which is that they're exhaustive. Uh -huh. um, I think we spoke about this when we last chatted that switch expressions have an additional constraint over switch statements that they have to be exhaustive because it would be very weird to write an expression since all expressions should evaluate to a value. Um, there was a switch expression and it didn't say what it was going to do for some cases, then what what value would we have? We would have to throw some, we'd have to make a new exception and, and throw it. And that doesn't seem very nice. So what we did with switch expressions was we have this additional requirement that it's exhaustive. So in other words, there's a label for every possible outcome or there's a default clause. Um, when you're um, uh, enhancing switch with patterns, uh, we'd like to do the same things. So we've had very positive feedback on this notion of exhaustiveness. And um, people have said, why couldn't you just roll that out for all switches? Well, of course, we can't do that for switch statements generally because that would break the entire world's <laughs> code base. So let's not do that. Um, but what we can do is say, well, if your switch is a new switch, it's one that's using patterns in the labels, then we can ask that that's exhaustive, whether it's a, state, a switch statement or a switch expression. Okay, I see. So uh, that's a very nice feature, but it turns out to be really quite tricky to uh, nail down that that precise um, notion because uh, when you add in record patterns it becomes really quite complicated because now you can write in your case block you can have all sorts of record patterns with nested things uh, nested patterns inside and then the compiler has to walk all the way through mm -hmm. and build actually a very complicated tree to work out did they cover all the causes? Did they miss something? Oh, I see something buried right down there that they forgot. Um, so it's actually quite a hard notion. And, and indeed, other languages that have features like this, languages like Haskell and Scala, they've all had to rewrite their exhaustiveness algorithm several times. So we're not done yet. Um, so uh, we'd like to have a bit more time to make sure we get that right. Yeah. Um, so, so those are that. So that's kind of where where we got to with with pattern matching. Okay, cool. And wasn't there some discussion regarding array? Arrays. Yes. So we um, we had an idea. Well, we still have an idea of uh, rolling out patterns that can match arrays. Yeah. And we added that in. But we got feedback, actually is a good example of kind of how the community can help us. Uh, we got some good feedback uh, where people said, yeah, this, this looks interesting, but don't we want to do something more powerful? And so that gave us kind of pause to think maybe 
we need to think more about this feature and we don't want to release something that might box us in when we come to generalize it later. So um, originally we uh, rolled uh, the array patterns in with the record patterns in the same JEP, but um, we decided to remove them. So now the record patterns JEP just deals with record yeah, patterns. I think it was a smart move because it's complex enough Yes, that's right. It's 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 complicated enough. Uh, it's made my life easier to have them separated. But we're not. We haven't given up on array patterns. We would, we'd like to do it, but we would like to have another think about mm. uh, how we how we do that and whether we can offer them in a in a more generalized, powerful way. Um, and that that's just going to take a bit of time. So we're 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 giving ourselves a bit of breathing space to do that. Okay. So other than that. Are there other things that you are thinking of regarding? Well, we have many, many plans for patterns. Yeah. Um, so um, in my pattern matching Java One talk, I I uh, sort of lift up the curtain and show a little bit of some of the things that we're looking at in the future. So we have uh, released a draft JEP about how we might extend pattern matching to deal more comprehensively with primitive types. Okay. Um, and so that will be a very nice extension. We have ideas which we've spelt out in some white papers about how we might roll out these sort of destructuring patterns like we have for record classes for all classes. Um, now, obviously, the, the reason we can do it for record classes is that record classes are a very special sort of class. And the compiler can always know how to pull your values apart. Yep. And obviously for an arbitrary class, it has no idea how you want that to be pulled apart. It's a bit challenging. <laughs> so we're not going to be able to, to figure that out. You're going to have to tell the compiler how to do it. Okay. So we're going to have to invent some new uh, members in a class and those members will be there to describe to the compiler how to destructure values. So that leads to a sort of an, in, an interesting direction where we need to mirror every way that we can construct values with a matching way to deconstruct them. So, uh, you know, the, the obvious cases are we need the opposite of a constructor. So for every constructor, you need a way to pull it apart. And the other way we often build objects is to use factory methods. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to need to have some opposite version of that. So for every fa factory method, you have a kind of some sort of deconstructor that can pull it apart and so do the opposite. And obviously you would expect all, both of these notions, you would expect to have some sort of round trip like property. So if you can, if you take a value, pull it apart and build it again, you should get something that looks like what you started with. Yeah. So um, it's very unlikely that the compiler can make sure that that's true, but uh, that would be the aim for you. Of course, that property is something the compiler can guarantee for records, which is why why it has such a, a, a nice time for records. But we have ideas about how to do this for classes. Um, and certainly we have ideas theoretically. Uh, there's a lot of pragmatic issues with doing that. Can you imagine? Um, we have some very complicated, I mean, actually for the first time in, in sort of my career, I think um, there's some very challenging syntactic questions here, um, not just semantic questions, but actually just figuring out uh, some sort of syntax that wouldn't be absolutely awful to use uh, is quite a challenge. Um, but I think we've made a lot of progress on the semantics of it as well. So we have a lot of a lot of things planned for, for patterns, so um, hopefully people can watch what we're up to. Yeah, it looks like you have a lot of work in front of you. <laughs> we're busy. <laughs> well, that's good, that's good. Yes. So moving on, uh, and that's kind of, uh, well, that, that's tied to what we just discussed. So uh, you had another session that was about uh, data-oriented programming. Yes. So can we discuss a little bit about that? So what is data-oriented programming? Yes, so um, uh, it's uh, the idea behind it is that we've noticed that a number of features that Project Amber has delivered, namely record classes, 
sealed classes and interfaces and pattern matching, when you have those three together, we've realized that many programs you can write in in, in a very interesting and new way. So uh, the, the, uh, the sort of slogan is that um, real world data often um, is, is somewhat simple. So it's the sort of thing you can represent as a record. So the sort of data I'm thinking of here is the sort of data you might come in from your service and you might get some data coming in as a JSON object or something like that, or very simple, you know, strings and, and so on. So that sort of data, obviously you can represent it as objects, but you don't really need all the power of generalized classes. These are very simple pieces of data. They're typically immutable. They're typically, you know, there isn't an interesting, there is, well, there's not a huge hierarchy. We don't, um, these objects, you know, are not long running. They don't have, you know, state and so on. So uh, you might want to represent them as records. Often with this data though, the, the individual data is quite simple, but typically you have a choice. So it might be, if you think of say, for example, JSON, you know, what's a JSON object? Well, it's either a JSON Boolean or it's a JSON number or it's a JSON um, uh, a map or it's a, you know, a JSON array. So you typically have simple data types and you need some way of expressing choice. So it's one of the following. Yep. Um, and so we can use records for representing the data and we can use seal classes to represent this bounded choice of the data types. So that gives us a very nice way to represent the data. And then pattern matching allows you to express your business logic, um, not as part of the objects, but just as a separate external function typically. Mm -hmm. So it would be typically, you know, a function that takes this representation of JSON or a representation of, uh, you know, results from a method call or something like that. And then what would you want to do with this thing? Well, uh, it could be one of several things. So we would like to use a switch and those things were our record values. So we'd like to use a record pattern to pull it apart and operate on it. So in the talk, I basically walk through a number of examples where we see that um, using these very simple techniques, you end up writing code that's very easy to read, mm. very easy to maintain, has a very simple control path so we're not, you know, part um, returning results, some with return values, some with miscellaneous exceptions. And then a client of that has to use try catch blocks and remember all the catch blocks and so on and so forth. You typically have a sealed hierarchy of record classes and then you write functions that switch over that hierarchy and use record patterns to match against them. And we found that in a number of examples, this really leads to much more beautiful code. And, um, you know, we all like beautiful code. Yeah, we do. <laughs> no, that, that's nice. And, and also, I mean, it, it, it's very compelling because if we go back to how it all started, uh, pattern matching, for instance, off, and then all the work that has been done, uh, seal class, and then oh, everything that you are doing and will do on pattern matching, I mean, it's very compelling from a from a developer point of view to see the, that evolution and what we end up with. So yeah, that's very exciting. Yeah. I think the the interesting thing is um, now we've kind of revealed enough yeah. that people can now really see how these features are connecting together. Yeah, the value and the benefits. And, and they, uh, you know, I'd, I like to think that they, the value it gives is kind of more than the sum of its parts. Yeah. They, these features were never developed in isolation. We always had this vision of how they would combine. And so everything was kind of carefully designed so uh, they could combine in the way that we anticipated. And then, you know, their, their benefits would magnify. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, you are a busy person, so two sessions was not enough, right? <laughs> so you did a third so it one. Seems. <laughs> so you did a third one. So uh, the other one which you did uh, related to Project Amber is string templates. Yes. 
Can we discuss that? Yeah, sure. So um, another big theme of Project Amber, so it's not all about pattern matching, um, is is actually strings. Um, so strings are, you know, an important part of any developer's uh, experience. And, uh, you know, I, there, there was clearly work that could be done in that space for Java too. Yeah. So um, primarily work by my colleague, uh, Jim Lasky, um, we... Uh, first released a feature called text blocks um, which again addressed a very long-standing uh, request from java programmers to kind of support you know multi-line strings was essentially the the request um, but it turns out that um, whilst that sounds simple actually getting exactly the feature that you want, the sort of two-dimensional feature um, that deals with white space in, in an intuitive way. It turns out to be quite subtle. And um, really, I have to say, I think text blocks are a very beautiful uh, feature that just really does exactly what you want as a programmer. Um, so it really addresses a thing that we all have to do a lot, which is that you're, you know, um, storing a, a program or a query or something as a string and you are developing that in another IDE and you just want to copy it into your Java code and put some triple quotes around it and do nothing else and it will be perfectly as you expect it to be uh, and it doesn't mess up all the white space and so on. This is exactly what you want um, and it was... Um, you know, quite subtle to get to that point. But I think once we got there, you really, I think people who use text blocks really appreciate how exactly on the nose they, they it hits that feature that you want. So you can, you exactly get this cut and paste behavior that you expect. So that was the kind of first step in, in trying to uh, improve the, the string experience in Java. Um, another feature that people have often requested, and it's, you know, very popular, um, feature in, in this area, you know, my in a former career of mine, I was an academic. So, you know, there's a lot of research papers about, um, string interpolation. So this is the idea that you might have strings with holes in and the, uh, holes would get filled in with values and evaluated, and then the string would be constructed. So there's a, you know, a very honorable tradition of academic work in this line. And many languages have had attempts at this feature so string templates is our first kind of proposal about how we might support strings and text blocks with embedded expressions um, so the idea is kind of what you expect it to be which is that within a string we have some sort of way to escape out of the string and embed an expression the way we uh, denote it is with a backslash curly brace, a curly opening brace, um, because that's an il uh, currently an escape sequence you can't use. Yeah, that's something I, I learned. Yes, so you can't use that in, in a string or text plot now, so that's good. Um, and uh, we didn't, you know, often people say, why didn't you use, you know, backslash round brace or some or backslash square bracket or something. But the thing is, between... in in between that escape character and a closing curly brace, yeah. you expect to put a Java expression. Okay, yeah. And the problem is round braces and square brackets are very useful in Java expressions. So they are, they are. We would get into all sorts of horrible escaping issues if, if we used yeah, those. So, um, so the idea is that within a string or a text block, you can escape out and put a Java expression. And then, uh, as you would expect, these things evaluate and become a string. But the really clever thing that, that uh, uh, my colleague Jim came up with is trying to generalize this experience. So many languages have a feature just like that. They just stop at that point. And, um, you know, the, the semantics of one of these things is that you uh, all the expressions are evaluated essentially the two string method is executed on them they'll become strings and we concatenate the string or the text block so that that kind of works but it's limited because mm. all you get out is a string 
And it's not really, you know, the Java way often is to provide a feature in a way that developers can use it themselves programmatically. Yep. So what we realized is that it would be great if that process of take all those expressions, evaluate them, glue them together, instead of that being something that was kind of built into the language by magic, so the compiler spotted what you were doing and then inserted all that code to do that, what if what it really did was um, invoked some code to do that? And obviously for something simple as string interpolation, we'll write that code for you. Um, we might write some others with form that understand about formats and so on. Um, but we could open it up. We could define some interfaces and allow you to write your own processor. Yeah, yeah, so, I see. So um, you can do some amazing things with this. So you can write your own um, processor that, say, takes a template, so, so a, a string with holes with expressions in, and not only evaluates the uh, expressions, but also processes the strings and does some, you know, puts things to uppercase and so on and so forth before gluing them together. It's up to you. It's just a Java program that takes uh, a string template and returns a string. So that might be a string template processor, right? Uh, the other amazing thing is that you can generalize this. So there's no reason why the processor, the thing that takes the template um, with the expressions, there's no reason why that has to return a string. It could return anything. And we have in our uh, white paper the proposal, if you read, we have a number of really incredible examples which uh, show that you can do all sorts of stuff. You can have it create, for example, you might not want a string. Maybe you want the JSON that it represents. Maybe the thing in the string is XML. Maybe you want an actual XML object to come out. No problem. Wrap it up it build your own custom processor, and away you go. Um, so we have a very very simple and beautiful sort of three interface hierarchy, the most general one that can throw an exception and returns you, you know, it's a full generic class as you would expect, so it returns you a T, and you can decide what that thing might be. Then we have a, a, a sub interface of that, which doesn't throw exceptions so that's useful and then you've got the one underneath which is just return strings so people would expect to write that but it's completely general you can write anything you like um, and we think that this provides um, a lot of power to the user and you know you really start getting into the space so I have to be careful because I don't want to say something that people might think unpromising but we can get into the space where these processors can do things that are very interesting especially for a company like oracle where for example it takes a string and produces a prepared statement sends it to sql gets a result set back processes it and outputs it and you can start writing these sorts of things yourself incredibly compactly um so I'm not promising that we're going to change the way you program against databases, but I think we're actually offering a framework where we could really start thinking yeah. about some exciting work in that area. Okay, that, yeah, that, that's really exciting. So what is the status of uh, string templates today? Yes, so um, I think this is uh, an example of, you know, kind of the, the way the open JDK process works. So we're not even at a JEP yet. Uh, we want, we're very excited about what we've got. We've got a prototype, we've got examples running, um, we've, and we've written a, a proposal for uh, a document to, to explain how we see this feature, how it can work. Lots of examples, lots and lots of examples. We've got a, a sort of draft form of the JEP. Um, we want people to take a look at it and let us know before we get to the stage of you know submitting it as a jep we really want early feedback yeah. uh we're super excited about the feature and we want to kind of get people's you know, want to test the temperature and and see what people think about this and if they kind of see other things that we've not thought of or whatever yeah um so we yeah we really want people's feedback on on 
on the proposal and then hopefully we can you know move it on in the standard open jdk way of you know producing preview jets and and get it on the train to to start heading towards the language so, so right now we have a draft jet and then so yeah once you have a better idea it will move to candidate yes yeah, so i hope hopefully the feedback so far is is good but we you know we want more people to look at it more people to play with it and then you know we'll we'll kind of take it from there but you know this is an example of us taking the community seriously yep. which we do it's a community process and we think this is an exciting direction for the language and we want people to kind of join in and and, and let us know how it goes for them yep. and also we have to think well to keep in mind that this is this is the java language so uh, well Obviously, uh, it's probably it will go through preview features stage. But uh, I mean, once it's in the platform, it's there for it's there forever. <laughs> yes. Well, you better get it right. <laughs> yes. No. Uh, this is the uh, the stressful part yeah, of this yeah, job. I can imagine. Uh, is yeah, we really can't make mistakes. Yes, yeah. uh, we have to get it right. I think. Um, I mean, that is certainly true, and I has kept me awake at night sometimes. Uh, but I have to say, I think the um, this new process that we have of previewing features and getting, you know, in particular, the expert group feedback, we have amazing experts who really push very hard on the features, read everything we write very thoroughly, um, find, you know, really hard <laughs> to spot bugs and so on. Um, you know, it's a, and, and being able to do that for several releases and refine the the design at each stage. I think, you know, we're, we're, uh, I feel very lucky as one of the designers because my predecessors didn't get that chance. They got a sort of one shot chance at getting it right. There's no V2. Exactly. And at, as, as you say, you know, Java has takes very seriously compatibility issues. So we can't go back. We can't, we can't just say to everybody, sorry, we've changing our minds. Everyone has to recompile their entire code base. Yeah, that's not going to fly. Uh, there's just no option of that. So um, we have this wonderful opportunity to, um, you know, come out with serious designs, but then give it time, give for experts and other, you know, the, the broader community to try it out and to let us know their experience. It's really experience that we we uh, appreciate, you know. Um, often people want to tell you about their preferred syntax and stuff like that. And, you know, sometimes that's yeah, interesting, but the the really important thing that we want from people, the broader community, is experience, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah take your favorite program and try rewriting it with a feature and tell us how it goes, what doesn't work. That, that's the stuff that no matter how much we do of that ourselves, the more people that can try that with their own code, code we've not written, uh, the better. So then we get experience, we have feedback of experience, and then we can say, wow, that was something we never thought of and, and hopefully, you know, address it. Um, so, yeah. And also the fact that, uh, so if we look at pattern matching, so that's a huge feature, uh, but it's it's delivered in multiple phases. Mm. So that helps you to design the features, but that's also help, I think, developers to uh, understand step by step, well, small features by small features, how things work. And at the end, as you say, we appreciate the real value of pattern matching when everything is delivered. Yeah, I hope so. I hope that's a nice experience for developers. It, it is, it is, it is. Yeah. So cool. Okay, well, I think um, we can wrap up. So um, I know that you are a busy guy. You have a lot of work, <laughs> yes. but I really appreciate that you spend the time with us today. So thanks, Kevin. Great fun chatting with you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye.